let's see. Yeah, we started out uh, uh, 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, we were down the street at 1564. And the neighborhood was completely different. The, uh, um, the person who uh, owned the building was a man, is a, he still owns that building, is a man named uh, Dr. Poulos. And he actually owns Margie's Candy. It's a, it's a candy store down the street that's been around for over 70 years. The same families owned it. You walk in there and like the guy's making candy right in front of you. Real nice guy. He's a, uh, he was a podiatrist and uh, rented the place for some ungodly amount. I think it was like uh, $400 a month. And uh, what was there before was, a, uh, was called the Wicker Park Art Gallery. And it was this... Uh, this guy named uh, Michael, who did framing and also sold his own paintings. His paintings were of uh, just the torso of men, again and again and again. He did probably a, almost a hundred paintings of torsos of men, and he decided he didn't want it, and so we moved there, and um, I had business partners, and it was a cafe and bookstore, and then it, it uh, and then I decided just to have the bookstore. We decided to split apart, and I moved down the street to uh, Damon and Evergreen, 1339 North Damon. And uh, I was only I was only at uh, um, Milwaukee for about a, a year, and then I moved to Damon. And when I moved there, this was before the neighborhood became gentrified, and now it's all gentrified. But back then, it was a crack house. There was a crack house upstairs, and. Um, I actually didn't really have that many problems with those people. Initially, I, I had a problem. They had stolen something, and we had a big argument. And, uh, the crackheads? Yeah, the crackheads. And uh, so we had a big argument, and then this guy uh, came down because I found the, the person's bicycle on the back porch upstairs in the crack house. So I just went upstairs and took the bike, and I told the guy who was standing out there not to take anything anymore. And, and his brother, who was running the crack house, came downstairs and we got in a big argument and ended up in a, in a fist fight and, and I was kind of freaked out by it. So then the next day when I came to work, I was thinking, my God, someone's going to like, someone's just going to come down and kill me. I mean, I just got in a fight with the guys in the head of the crack house. And, and when I came to the store, it was, uh, there was nobody there, naturally. There's nobody waiting for me outside. There's nobody at the store. And... Um, the guy, his name was Tony, uh, who was running the place, walks in, and that's the guy I got in a fist fight with, and I'm thinking, I can't believe this, and, you know, after all this time, you know, I've lived in Chicago all this time, and then suddenly someone's going to come here and kill me over this stupid bookstore, and those are the thoughts I had inside my head, and he came up, and right to the counter, and, and, uh, he said, you know, I want to apologize for everything that happened yesterday, and uh, you were actually right. The person who you yelled at about stealing the bicycle actually stole it, and it was my brother, and that's why I got all upset. And um, But I've taken care of it, beat the hell out of him. It'll never be a problem again. And I said, uh, he was, I don't want you, you know, I don't want you to get upset. And I said, well, you know, the, the problem is, is that, you know, I don't care what you guys do upstairs. It's none of my business. And I'm telling you, I will, I will never call the police unless someone shot or something bad happens or somebody runs in and tells me like because I don't care you guys were here and I moved in but you guys can't mess with the bookstore either because it's how I make a living and and you can't just just like take things and I can't have people afraid to come in and he said sure so we had like this agreement going on and it, it actually uh, uh, worked out it actually worked out and uh, I was there for like three years Nothing really happened. I had, it was it was uh, somebody drove through the front of the place one time, but I guess they were drunk, and uh, somebody smashed out the window and grabbed the register. It was probably just some crazy crackhead guy. But another time, uh, I had some idiot working for him, and he left the front door open, and the guys upstairs found out. We, we were open until one o'clock in the morning. The guys found out somehow that the door was open, and when I came in the next day, we opened it. Uh, 10 o'clock, I think, when we might have opened, 11 o'clock. When I came in the next day, the guys from upstairs were sitting in the bookstore. But they weren't, hadn't taken anything, they were just watching everything so that they knew that some crazy customer wasn't going to come along. And uh, it worked out. It really worked out. And, and you know, it, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't like some nice little uh, Hollywood 
movie. I mean, there were there would be some crack whore would come in all drunk out of, or cracked out of her mind and want to offer us sex for ten bucks. And I mean, it was it was really pathetic at certain times. And and there was one of the guys upstairs uh, got shot and killed. So it wasn't uh, it was kind of scary sometimes. But it worked out. I mean, we just uh, I mean, I I told him I was like, look, you know. If, if, if I call the police, who do you think the police are going to believe? The guys upstairs or the white guy who owns the store? I'm like, there's no way. Like, so, you know, we shouldn't... There, you'd, obviously, they're, the police, for whatever reason, I know it it's, uh, sounds bad, are going to be more concerned with me than a bunch of crackheads upstairs. That's just how it is. And it worked out for years. I never had a problem. And I, 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 didn't, I never really had a problem. Then, uh... uh the building was sold, and we had to move, and so they threw everybody out, and I was paying $300 a month, and now a couple years later, the person is paying $5,000 a month for the same space. What year are you talking about now, $300? $300 was, um, this is 2000, so it was 1991, 92, it was $300. But it was messed up when I got there. There was a huge hole in the floor. There was a uh, there was a hole in the back of it. It was all filled with garbage. I had no idea how big the store was when I first got it, and I found out that there was actually, it was bigger than I thought. There was a whole room full of garbage, and uh, the uh, it was a horrid, a horrid place. The back of it was uh, the floor had was a big hole in the floor, and what I thought was just dirt, and it turned out that was like the top of a of a rat's nest. It was so large that it had, it was, it, I had gone down in the basement. It was literally taller than me, and they had worked their way up through the floor. So I ended up just putting a riser up because I couldn't, I couldn't get, take down the rat's nest because I'm, I'm afraid of rats, and I'm not going to do battle in some guy's basement, you know, tearing down some. So we just put a riser on it, and I got a couple cats. And the cats would, uh, they'd kill the rats. They were good. Uh, I still have one of them. One of the cats is still here. And they, uh, they'd corner rats as big as them. And, uh, here she is. Hey. Hey. And, um, we're being interviewed for the year 2000. Hi. Hi. Hey. The light's out in the bathroom. So. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. But, uh, so we ended up putting a riser up, and, and, uh, there were, it was a terrible place. Terrible. Horrid place. And the third floor, the landlord, had uh, thrown out some of the crackheads, and what he did is he turned off the water and the electricity. But they lived there anyway, and they just would take craps in his closet for years. Now somebody's paid $220,000 for a condo that used to be the crackhead's apartment that somebody was crapping in the closet. I always wonder, like, I, I'm always, I'm always want to go over there and knock on the person's door and say, do you know what was in your closet? I mean, it was horror. It was one of the most disgusting places I, I'd it was a, it was a terrible place. But I was able to continue the business. And what kind of business is in there now? It's a uh, quickie mart, like a little food store, owned by these guys, who uh, you know, like these two brothers, two immigrant brothers who are just working constantly. That kind of. But they're paying five thousand dollars for the space. Yeah, it's five thousand dollars. The place next door to it is a uh, is a. Uh, um, is an insurance agency, and they, and it's this, that store is half the size of the old store, and they're paying I think 22. The reason I know this is because I I moved the store, the store is moved, and so I'm always interested in what the uh, price of real estate or the the uh, how much things are renting for. I always have to be aware because I don't own a building, so you have to be aware, even if you have a lease, and uh, rents have gone up. That What's your much. situation now here? Now we pay. Uh, Two thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars a month. Things have changed in ten years. The neighborhood's changed, but we've gotten uh, bigger. And after all this time, we just kept uh, buying more books and buying books. Um, the uh, there's been a lot of bookstores that have uh, opened and closed. I think it was twelve in ten years. There's been twelve bookstores that opened and closed in the neighborhood. Tell me about your bookstore. What kind of books do you sell? It's just there? it's just used books mostly. We sell some new books, but all the books that we have, we never go out looking for books. We decided early on that the the idea would be as if we is that we couldn't compete against these huge conglomerate bookstores that offer forty percent off of books, 
And so what we would do is that I would just buy books from people walking in and uh, you know I put out flyers saying we buy books and just create a neighborhood store and since the rent was cheap and I knew what people were reading because that was the stuff people were bringing in and at the time there were a lot of artists living here there were uh, um, people who'd lived here for years and years writers and I mean uh, Nelson Algren had lived down the street and the rents were really cheap so there were people who you know, for whatever reason, were able to to live in a real inexpensive place. And a lot of them had books, so what, but a lot of them read. So, and I knew what they were reading, so that somebody would come in and I'd sell me stuff. I'd turn around and I would sell it. And so, it, I didn't have to really worry about what the market was. I knew what the market was. What year did you come to this neighborhood? Um, and where were you coming from? Personally, me. I'm oh, sure. I, I. Are you I've also lived here. A resident here or yeah, also? I've lived here. I live a uh, half a block down. I've lived uh, at, at uh, 1562 Milwaukee for 10 years. And I just signed another 10 year lease. By the, the uh, man who owns the candy store, he owns the building. He's a wonderful guy. Just, uh, you know, it, it works out. But uh, I moved here from, uh, in, uh, it's been like 15 years ago. We graduated from college, and a buddy of mine and I. Uh, moved here and he was from the north side and I'm from the south side and so our compromise was that we would move to this neighborhood because there's excellent transportation, the L, the uh, uh, Milwaukee Avenue bus, the North Avenue bus, you know, Damon, it's a great, it's, a, it's just, if you need to get downtown, you need a job, this, it's such a great place, that's why we moved here originally and it was really cheap and so. What was it like in 1985 in this neighborhood? Well, it was a very different neighborhood. It was a, it was, uh, it was primarily uh, Hispanic and older Polish people, and at the time they were starting the gentrification. So there were certain uh, real estate companies that were uh, going in, buying buildings for like fifteen thousand dollars from people, and then getting rid of those people, and then turning around and selling it for eighty thousand dollars to some yuppies who were convinced that this was the place to live. And at the time, you could get Literally, I mean, there's people who've bought, spent like forty thousand dollars and bought mansions that were down the street, mansions, though, right, right on the park, where now those things are going for a million, two million dollars, and uh, it was just real estate speculation. But all the people who used to live here, there's no, there's literally no one that still lives here. I have one friend, one friend who still lives here that I knew all that time. Everyone's gone. The old people are gone, and everyone's gone. Where did they go? Hey, some people, the artists, a lot of them moved to. Pilsen. Some of them just moved. They just are gone. They just disappeared. Moved. Try to move somewhere else where you can. It's a shame. It's a real shame. There was that we uh, we're on Milwaukee Avenue, and Milwaukee Avenue was filled. All the storefronts were rented. It might be some goofy places, you know, like you know Jethro's mattress resale shop. But they were, they were all places. They were all whether it was a do, There were lots of dollar stores. There was a uh, uh, two places that two cobblers. You could get your shoes fixed. There were uh, uh, lots of places to sit down and eat. You know, George's everything for a dollar nine was down the street, so you could get anything on the menu for a dollar nine. So, but that's not like that anymore. Now, all those places are gone, and there's lots of empty storefronts, and there's no place to you can get something to eat for a dollar nine. There's no. How much does it cost to eat around here now? Well, it's two dollars for a cup of coffee next door. How much do you think a cup of coffee was in 1985? 50, 75 cents. They're going to open up a Starbucks down the street, and it's, you know, a lot of people's minds, the death knell for the neighborhood to have. But that's just how it is. There's going to be, there's just going to, there, I'm sure there'll eventually be a, a more national stores to replace all these stores that were owned by the people who were sitting in the store. Now the stores aren't like that. Now there's not, there's more uh, bars and restaurants, and those, they're not open during the day, so there's not people shopping on the street anymore. It's not uh, so much, so so much. I mean, it's a different kind of people. Now people shop on the weekend, you know, because people are working during the week. But it used to be there were, you know, drug stores and jewelry stores, places to get ice cream parlors, little kind of goofy things like that, places to pay your bills. And now those places are gone. And was there nightlife then? Oh yeah, it was. It was. It was far different though. There were. There was a punk bar. A, I mean, a hillbilly bar, not a country and western, but like hillbillies. 
hanging out. People would, you know, somebody would pull out a gun and shoot a decanter that was an Elvis decanter. There was a, a jazz uh, bar two blocks down that called the Get Me High that had uh, jazz, live jazz, from four o'clock in the afternoon to uh, two o'clock at night, and then beyond that, they would just lock the door and people would just play all night. And had been there for years. Jimmy Carter came in there and, and uh, drank. And that was closed down because uh, some a lawyer built a townhouse next door to this bar and then complained about the noise. So then the bar had to stop playing uh, live music and then uh, the bar was eventually sold. Now it's a martini bar. A bunch of people with frosted hair. It's uh, I mean, there, were, uh, there was a transvestite bar down the street. There was a... Uh, I mean, it was just a... a, 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 a Mexican bar where people would play live Mexican music, guys with sombreros, people playing. Uh, Polish bars where people playing really obnoxious Polish pop music. But all this, there was all this stuff within, in the neighborhood, within the small little neighborhood that we have. And now there's none of that anymore. Now there's uh, sports bars and, and uh, just your basic. Take me there. What's this neighborhood about in the year 2000? It's just, it's uh, turning into a, the same thing as all the other. It's, it's just the whole, um, you know, making everything look exactly the same. People who've moved here all from the suburbs are all a bunch of suburban people, and they're all young. There's no families living here anymore. It's just uh, yuppie people living here for like three or four years, and then they're going to move. What is a yuppie? Well, it's people with just money who, who uh, have no concept of, of what it is, to me, have no concept of of what it is to live any other life except the life that they live, and they think that everybody else should live like that. So to them, it's absolutely stupid that there's a uh, botanica down the street. There's a small little botanica. It's a you know what a botanica is, and uh, but they people hate that place. They hate it. A botanica is a uh, is a uh, it's a it's like a um, they sell uh, candles. Sometimes there's for uh, Santeria. Sometimes uh, it's, uh, but basically it's uh, people who you can go there and you can tell the person your, your ailments, say, hey, I got a sore leg, and the guy can mix you up something and you can put it on there. It's, sometimes it's homeopathic medicine, but it's, uh, it's all Hispanic. I think it's from Mexico. So unless you're speaking Spanish, you really don't know what the hell is going on. You can buy candles and I think it, I'm not too sure exactly because uh, I don't speak Spanish, but you can go there and you can get... Uh, potions for your ailments or mixed whatever and they have things you can uh, make little altars do whatever let's say Hispanic but I know people who hate that place why what do they say? because because they'd rather have some other place and some place they could buy shoes that just like the place across the street or some place they can buy high-priced antique furniture like the place across the street they want everything to be exactly like a mall so it could be just what they want they can't they don't want to have an independent coffee shop, they want to have a coffee shop that's the Starbucks that they know they can go in and get exactly what they want. It's a safety issue. That's why people move to the suburbs, is for safety. Not just the safety and, and this is just my opinion on that. And, but uh, the safety not only of, you know not, somebody's not going to break in and rob you, but to know that what's right around the corner. If you go on the next block in the suburbs, it's just like the block before. If you go on the next block in the, in the city, it could be some, something completely different. You, you don't know, but people like to have that safety, and so... So do they come here with the intention of creating change, or come here with the idea that they are moving here because it is the way it is? They come here twofold, mainly because it's a great investment, because they know they can come here and buy a townhouse or a little condo for $220,000, leave in three years, and they, and they can sell it for two hundred and fifty. I mean, that's, there's that, but also the idea that it's been sold as a place where this is where the artists live, this is where, and it, and it has been sold, not only by uh, uh, the, the city itself, by real estate people. You walk into any real estate company, like, oh, this is a, a hot spot. There's no artist is going to be spending, you know, 2500 bucks a month for a place to live. It's just ridiculous. And even, like, you go to the Art Institute, this is one of the places they recommend you go to. Like, it's like that. Well, over, over, when you're uh, going to the Art Institute and they're saying, oh, places to live in Chicago, as a, as a student, you know, this is one of the places they mention. And that's, you know, who wants a bunch of students living around you? you students know. spend money, though, don't they? No, not really. Not really. Students spend money on students' things. We have, since we've moved here, and back, uh, we were on division, and Wicker Park is just a triangle of Milwaukee, uh, 
daemon and division. It's just a triangle. So we've always just keep going in circles. And now we have more people stealing stuff than ever before. We have uh, somebody just had a, there was a, a $60 book that somebody took a razor and cut a picture out of and just took off. There's a, uh, people catch people stealing constantly. And the things that people steal are on the road, you know, naked lunch, things that are just the total young hipster student stuff. And it's pathetic that you have to keep stuff separate and they have more stuff stolen and now we have television cameras to watch things when we've moved to the nicer neighborhood. Tell me about that. When did you put in cameras and what was the idea? The idea is that, we, that people were stealing things and that we would catch people stealing things. And they would be people that, that for no reason would, they, after you would catch them stealing, they'd take money out of their pocket and throw it at you, saying, okay, you caught me. Like that was going to make everything better. And if they had the money, why were they trying to steal it anyway? It's so crazy. what would you do in that situation? Well, I'd call the police. And what would they do? I did arrest them. And it's, you know, it's just for a misdemeanor, but I just, you know, I'm not going to wrestle somebody for a $15 book. I'm not going to... Oh, that's what the police are for. So you know? what is that? I don't understand that. Why do the people who move in with more money are the ones steal? who steal stuff? I don't know. That's the great question, isn't it? Why are the people who, have, who are more, the more affluent somebody is, the, the more they... I don't, that is, there's so many different uh, questions, I guess. Maybe somebody in the, in the, the future will tell us. I don't know, it's, it's, uh, there's all different kinds of opinions. Hey. Hey. I don't know, it's a, it's a strange phenomenon. So you why, why would somebody commit a crime when they don't have to? Right, I don't know. You have to ask Kafka and Dostoevsky. <laughs> they do the same thing. It's, Leopold and Loeb did the same thing, just to get away with it, I guess. Like, isn't that... I, I don't really know. I, to, tell you, to tell you the truth, I don't really... I stole uh, uh, something from a, a bar one time, probably 15 years ago, and I, I felt so guilty about it. I stole an ashtray. I felt so, so guilty about it, and then I, uh, I was in a, a cafe, and the woman behind the counter was the former owner of the bar. And I felt so guilty I had to tell her, just because... Uh, this was after I owned a store, so I already knew. But people steal everything. She said she couldn't even remember, it meant nothing to her. Probably the same thing I would say if somebody's like, hey, I stole an ash carry from your place. I couldn't remember. So you use, <laughs> you use the word gentrification. Can you, what does that mean? Gentrification is just uh, people from a different socioeconomic scale moving in and throwing the people out. And where those people go, I mean, people are literally thrown out, thrown out in the middle of the winter. They, the people will come by and say, hey, we sold the building. Now you're going to have to leave. If people say, well, I got a lease, I'll just do something like, oh, yeah, we're going to be replacing windows this winter. Let's take your windows out or turn off your gas. Or There's no, uh, there's no real tenants' rights. There's no... How is that gentrification as opposed to just the way real estate works? Well, it, real estate works by if you're going to sell something and somebody else buys it. If there's a concerted effort by, by people or by uh, groups of real estate agents or people who own uh, agencies, to change a neighborhood to get rid of people, well, that's that's a lot different than just somebody deciding to sell their house. It's it's people going over and breaking some, literally breaking ladies' arms to get them to sell their houses. There was a riot here, and, and, and it, there used to be a, a horrid place called Easy Life Real Estate. It was one of the first uh, people here, and they would uh, do some of the worst. They, the police would. The guy actually had uh, had to pay people money because he would strong arm them into selling. Mostly people who couldn't speak English. He was one of the first people who, uh, but in, in, in uh, I think it was, it was a green festival. Every, you know, Chicago always has, every neighborhood has a festival. It's one of the cool things about the place. And uh, ours is called a greening festival. And it's people just, uh, people have always, it, for some reason, people have always had gardens in this neighborhood. I'm not too sure why. And uh, so it's, it was everybody had a chance to like make their garden look nice. It had gone on for years. And one of them, it was either 85 or 87, there was a riot. Because one of the, they have it in the park, and one of the mansions on the park is run by, is owned by a guy who ran one of the real estate companies. It was literally a, a riot. The police showed up. The, the guy has put speakers in his window because people were protesting, put speakers in his window, and turned up like really loud rock music that drowned out the people protesting. I mean, you know, it certainly wouldn't be going on if it was just some crazy thing in someone's head. I'm sure all these people who are protesting are now gone. But I know the guy still lives there. What year are you talking about? It's either 80, it's between 85 and 87. I can't remember what it was. Really interesting, though, that, that uh, yeah, and you, now you'd never think. They did things like at the time they decided they didn't want certain people hanging out in the, uh, in the park. So they wanted to take down all the, uh, the uh, basketball 
well, who is that? I mean, just think about the idea of, like, who is it that you don't want in the park if you're taking down the basketball courts? It's obvious. What the people who lived around there didn't like these black kids playing basketball. Crazy things like that. Eventually, they were able to uh, save at least, save, they saved two of them. Two what? Two basketball courts. The other ones are gone. I mean, that's... And so, so when you're living in a place like, and you're having to do battle against stuff like that, when they're, when they're trying to tear down the, the church to put up condominiums, and then you spend time, whether it's going to a bake sale or giving money or going to a, a community meeting to stop that, then other things tend to get away from you, like the idea that your neighbors are getting thrown out of their house. There's so many dynamics that are going on that I think, just in my opinion, it was really difficult for people to actually be able to make a stand against what was going on. Because some people thought it was great. I mean, some people, if you buy a place and 10 years later your place is buy it for 15000 next thing you know it's worth $150,000. That's, that's nice. Except, you've got to pay tax on it. And the tax on that stuff is what got rid of all the old people. So the old people ended up paying more for tax than they did for their house. They'd have to leave. Which is sad. I, mean, I knew people that were here for like 40, 50 years that just had to leave. That's just gone. Who knows where they are? Missed their home just because they just because some jerk off next door built a townhouse that cost two hundred and fifty thousand shouldn't mean that you, that means that you have to leave your neighborhood that someone's taking away your house because you can't afford the tax. It's a terrible thing. Hopefully they'll they'll fix that. They should. I would hope that they should. Uh, I don't know. It's it's uh, and people resent that and then people are very unhappy and then people were very mad in the neighborhood and so then there were people that hated each other and there was all kinds of. There would be graffiti all over the neighborhood when this towards the very end, and now all that's gone. What kinds of graffiti? Oh, like yuppies out, and uh, people. There were um, um, people would do all kinds of things, like uh, uh, try to disrupt. They have a uh, um, an arts festival here, and there would be people trying to disrupt the arts festival because the arts festival was turned into uh, basically a giant real estate venture. It was really sad. It was really pathetic. They, they had, uh, the originally it was a, called the Coyote Arts Festival. People in the neighborhood who were artists would be able to display their artwork in, um, mostly in storefronts. And it was run by the uh, Coyote Gallery, which was long gone. And, um, but it was really nice. So you know, it was kind of organized. People come in, there were hundreds of artists. But what happened was, is that they realized that they could make a lot of money at this. And what, what they did was, was they would be able to, they, the people who were in charge of it, realized that they could uh, have more support if they worked well with the real estate companies. So a real estate company would say, oh, you know, there's this townhouse that we got down the street. And uh, maybe we could have uh, paintings put up there. And then we could also give people information on how to buy the place. So the arts festival that the artists were participating in was actually getting rid of the artists who were in the neighborhood. So eventually the prices went up and everybody had to leave. And they did it all over storefronts. It was, it was uh, real sad. Now it's, people won't participate and there's no artists living here anymore so it just keeps getting smaller and smaller. And it's, uh, it's a shame how the people were used. But what can you do? What do you think the future of the neighborhood is? A few, this neighborhood's just going to get just like uh, Lincoln Park and uh, Old Town will look exactly the same with the Starbucks. And we have a Penny's Noodles. We have a, it looks just like all the other places. And all the people here look exactly the same. It's not like you'll... How do they look? They all look like a bunch of college guys. They, we have a, a, I, have a, a, I have a really hard time getting uh, insurance for my windows because people break out the windows. But they don't steal anything. It's like these drunk people getting mad and throwing something through the window. And why would you break a window if you at least take something? And all the people up and down the block are the same way. Is it, are they breaking your windows or they're just breaking windows? Everybody's windows. They'll just like get, and then they'll hop in their car and go back to Schaumburg or whatever the heck they're from. It's really, uh, but there used to be a lot of things going on. There was a, a, a place that had a, a international music. Um, there was just so many things going on. There were, there were uh, not only were there galleries, but there were, uh, there were theaters. You know, for six dollars, you could walk a block away from your house. You go see a, go see some theater. You know, you'd go see some jazz. You could go 
And and you, you could go down to a, a tavern. They're getting rid of more and more taverns. You know, taverns are only open during the, usually during the, the, uh, the daytime and a little bit at night, and they serve food. So it's like a restaurant and a bar. And uh, it's a neighborhood place. You'd go down, there'd be some people serving a really good veggie chili and Polish sausage, people who'd owned it for years and years and years. Just all kinds of things, places. And it was, it, but it was, now it's getting more and more just like every other place. What, uh, what do college students look like? You just said that they all look the same. How would you describe that? Well, they're all dressed in whatever clothes is the current clothes. It's, uh, I can't remember the thing that's gone now. There's a little, uh, it's not. Hey, what's the name of that thing that North, the little coat thing that everybody wears? Oh, there's a couple North of Binger or North? North Face? North Face? Is that what it is? North Face? REI. REI, North Face? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's basically people with uh, uh, clothes that seem to advertise the clothes themselves. Um, all very clean, loud, young. Hello. They're interviewing me about the uh, the O.J. Simpson trial, and it's my deposition. And I'm actually Kate O'Keelan. I shaved my head. <laughs> hey, tell me about your ideas about the larger city in general at this point in history. This one? Yeah, I mean, right now. When you oh, Chicago's Chicago the most wonderful place, place to, in the world. There's no other city like Chicago. I absolutely love Chicago. There's, I mean, I, I can't stand living in this neighborhood. But you could live in, in another neighborhood. It's the most livable place. It's, it's beautiful. That's why everybody comes here. You know, people always say things like, uh, ooh, it's all, it's uh, uh, very segregated. It is segregated. There are, but the reason it's segregated is because there's so many different people come here. You can well, go down Damon and you can go from going through a, an old German neighborhood. You can end up in a neighborhood that's full of uh, people from the Middle East and Korea. And, and they have moved in, and those people moved into a, a neighborhood that used to be Swedish. So you, you'll, you'll see like a, a store that sells Swedish stuff, and then next to it is a, a store that you have no idea what it is because everything's written in Korean. And there'll be like a real tasty uh, you know, Iranian restaurant there. I mean, it's that kind of stuff. There's people who, what's it got, like the second largest uh, Polish population outside of, oh, it's, it's the second largest uh, Pol city of uh, Polish people outside of uh, uh, Kiev or whatever, Warsaw, whatever the thing is. That's kind of neat. I mean, people come here. I know people who are Serbian. I know people who are... I mean, you can meet... There's a guy working on my uh, electricity at my house, and he's um, Korean, Chinese, Mongolian, and he's married to this Mexican woman. And, it's, and he's just some guy I had called up out of the book. I was like, oh, I need my electricity. And it's just like... That guy's here living in Chicago. How would he get here? Why do people come here? It's got to be because it's because you can actually f find a neighborhood with people who speak the same language from you, and uh, you can find work. You can always find work. You can always find, and it's it's beautiful. You can go to the beach. It doesn't cost anything. It's a, it's a nice place to live. It's great weather in the summertime. It's not so bad in the wintertime either. And it's, and, it, and the and the city itself is, is beautiful. It's just really beautiful. So if you hate this neighborhood so much, why do you live here? Why because my store business? is here. Why do you keep your business here? Because I'd have to move the whole store again. And I'm planning a, uh, on selling the store. And I'm actively selling the store at this point, so probably a year from now I won't even own it. How do you sell the store if you yourself are a renter? Well, you, you oh, it's no problem at all. You have a lease. You have a six-year six year lease with a three-year option. That lease is actually worth something. So. I mean, you can sell the store with all the stock. You have uh, a certain amount for the lease. Depends how much it, it makes. Yeah. Well, and what would you I mean, do? you can sell a lease. If you sold this place, what would you do? I'm going to be a farmer. Where are you going to do that? In with? Arkansas. I'm going to be a farmer. Why Arkansas? It's uh, really beautiful. And it's, uh, it's, it's around Fayetteville. And Fayetteville has a large university. It's in a uh, national forest, and uh, two people, uh, the guy from I think Tyson Foods and the guy from Walmart, both were from there, and they died and they willed a bunch of money to the, uh, to the uh, town, and so there's performing arts centers. It's kind of a nice place to live. Do you think you'll be able to find a Korean-Mongolian electrician there? 
I don't know, maybe my Korean Mongolian uh, electrician will come and see me. You know? I mean, it doesn't matter, just uh, I think I'm just one, I just, uh, I don't want to live in the city my whole life. Do I've already know? lived in the city my whole life. Do you know anything about farming? Huh, can't be that. Anything that people have done for thousands of years can't be that hard. You know, if you, it, it can't be, right? No. Right. Right. Cooking. Yeah, cooking's pretty easy. <laughs> I do pottery. I have a potter studio. That's pretty easy. Thing. That's pretty easy thing to do. And and uh, the, I won't have the same problems because I'll have a, a farm that's paid for, so I won't be. Con I did like a, an organic farm and raise uh, sheep, and some rabbits, and I've actually thought a lot. I've actually gone into a little bit more than just uh, off the top of my head. I mean, I go on vacation to places that are organic farms or rabbit farms, and just to see what it's like. It'll be something new. You don't want to get old in the city. The city's real hard for old people. They don't. The sidewalks aren't shoveled. You know, just having some. If you're in your 80s and you're waiting for a bus and the bus doesn't show up for 20 minutes, it's a much bigger problem than if you're 15 years old waiting for the bus. It's really hard for people. I think. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. I think it's really yeah. hard. You know, they have a place like this, like this neighborhood. You could be living in this neighborhood. Suddenly, the, the neighborhood changes, and they do things like take away your grocery store. Right. You know, so they, you have to it's go across gone. Town, yeah. Right, and then you got to go across town. Yeah. Well, it's a problem if you're in your 70s or if you're right. living in the. And all your friends have moved out, and you don't have people to help you. Exactly. And you know. When people keep getting kicked out. Yeah. So, who wants to be old in the city? So, is what you've described in this neighborhood unique to this neighborhood? No, they they tried doing it other places. I mean, this the one thing about this neighborhood is that it was planned. It was something that was actually planned, and uh, excuse me, I think other neighborhoods it's a little bit more difficult because there's so many um, different people involved, and also there's some things in neighborhoods like it, they're trying to do it all the time in uh, uptown. The problem with uptown is is uptown has a bunch of things like uh, uh, convalescent centers, has like a uh, halfway houses for mental patients and there's no way in the world that someone's going to be paying a quarter million dollars to live next to I mean there's no way that someone's going to move from Winnetka there no way so that I mean it happens and also there was stuff here if they lived next to a crack house why would they live next to a convalescent home the crack house isn't there anymore and the the uh, they were trying to get rid of that crack house for years I, had pe I used to have people come in the store trying to get me to sign a petition to tear down the building <laughs> 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 and they got rid of it, you know, and so, you know, you know, they, they, there's no open space here anymore. There used to be a, a community gardens, and they're always like selling the community garden, and somebody will build a, a big house on it, and then put a fence around it, and then hire people to make a nice garden inside behind the fence. I always think that's really strange, but... They, yeah, there's no open space anymore. There's really ugly buildings. They've, they've put up buildings that are just, they have nothing to the, the buildings here are really beautiful. You know, it's just some, you know, it's a, this neighborhood was a planned community. They built, the, the guys who built these, this neighborhood, they built a neighborhood where on the park would be the rich people, off the park would be like middle management people. You could have people who were, uh, just workers were living down the street in Ukrainian village or Bucktown. And, I mean, and they built the factories here. I mean, it was this was a planned community from the very beginning. So that's that's why the architecture is so wonderful. So everything was built right after the fire. And so there's, I mean, these these buildings here are going to last forever. And so then some idiot will tear it down and then put up a cinder block building that just is really disturbing. You've seen it down the street. Why are people willing to spend so much money for those homes? Because because uh, you'll get your money back. Because the the real estate has not gone down, and as long as you can move someplace, I mean, think about it. If you're if you're young, you don't have kids, you just get married, you can move someplace right down the street from uh, downtown, and in a couple of years you leave and you get to make a profit. Sure, why not? Although I mean, you know, it's just, it just makes it makes sense. He'll stay. What time are you going to be back? Um, 
Okay. Okay. I don't know what else is there. I don't feel? know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the... How do you feel? About what? Feel? About this whole process. I mean, about what you're describing. Are you angry? Or are you sad? Well, I'm very angry. I mean, it's, it's, I'm very angry. I'm very angry that the... That just the idea that somebody can come and uh, who doesn't live in a neighborhood, who has nothing to do with the neighborhood, but can come into a place and decide that these people are going to have to leave and these people are going to move here and they get to make money off it and they destroy whatever attractiveness that the neighborhood had. You know, I mean, now it's more like a college town half the time. There's people, it's kind of strange. I mean, it's kind of strange that like the Bulls will win and somebody, you know, it's not, it's somebody from. You know, so I've, I've like I've watched I've like I've, I mean I've been here. I live right on the on Milwaukee Avenue too, so I get to see all these things going on. You know, like somebody you know, some suburban guy will get like mad at his girlfriend and punches out a window. I mean, I've, I saw it a couple months ago. Yeah. He was arguing with his girlfriend, punched out a window, and then the police had to come and get him. You know, or that not the police, the uh, the uh, the ambulance comes and you know that guy's not going to pay for that stuff. What what is that? I mean, at least uh, if people uh, are here or if it's your neighborhood, then you can be like, hey. You know, you can talk to the people around you go, hey, you know, there's people at the at bar across the street. We've got to do something about it. But you're never going to be able to do that if the neighborhood is so transient because nobody gives a shit. Nobody's registered to vote. Nobody does anything because, you know, you're not going to be here that long. And people will tell you that. I'm not going to be here that long. Why should I care? Why should I, you know, get have the people across the street at me mad? I'm not going to be here that long. And so it's staying. I mean, it's really, it's really kind of sad. What about the local leadership, elected leaders? Like the aldermen and the, uh... Who's responsible? Other than the police, who do you call when something like that happens? Who do, how do you organize to make a change? Who's well, the problem is, is when people have organized, they usually end up having to move. Um, no. And so you, you can't really organize. And all the people that used to organize and that used to be around are, are gone. Now, all the people who originally had, uh, had uh, an interest in keeping and keeping in a neighborhood are gone. Because you can't, uh, you know, whether it's a, uh, I mean, it's just, it's just not, I mean, uh, the, and, and actually, uh, the uh, elected officials, elected officials always uh, are going to uh, be doing whatever the people who give them the most money believes, but whoever contributes the most to their uh, campaign, whoever, I mean, that's, that's politics. That's just re the reality of politics. And because there's no um, rent control, there's no uh, property tax cap, there's no none of that, then it keeps everything real transient. It just naturally does it. Tell me what it's like being, what is an independent bookstore owner and how is that, uh, do you feel like that existence is in jeopardy these days? I mean, what does it mean to talk about national stores coming to the neighborhood and things like that? Well, um, you know, this, the same thing it would mean that if you're if you own a coffee house and then Starbucks moves in across the street from you, or you own a coffee house and Starbucks tells you that they're going to buy you out or they're going to move across the street. I mean, you can't compete against people who can you know, a Barnes and Noble that can come in and, and work and have a store that can work at a loss. I mean, I can't afford to lose money, but somebody can come and say, well, we're going to have this store here and we'll, we know we're going to lose money for four or five years, but that's okay. I can't lose money for a month. Neither can other small businesses. Why are they able to lose money for four or five years? Well, it's a tax rate. It doesn't really matter. The same thing why Amazon.com has never made any money. Amazon's never made any money. What is Amazon? Amazon, Amazon is the, uh, is, uh, nowadays people can order stuff over the internet. They do a, a book search over the internet, and Amazon is a bookstore that only exists over the internet. And so they, you know, will have a, a huge stockpile of books, and you call up and say, or you dial up and say, I want this book, and they'll send it out to you in a couple days. Well, they have millions of titles, because they don't have a, a, a storefronts to worry about. They don't, and, they, and because they sell so much, they can make deals with publishers and say, hey, or distributors actually you make a deal with the distributor and say hey we will if you give us exclusive rights to your books we'll 
guarantee we'll give you $3 million worth of business, but you have to give us 50% off the books. And they'll get that deal. Well, I can't get 50% off because I can't sell three, four million dollars worth of books. And so it's, it's very unfair. And, and uh, why businesses can exist without making a profit is beyond me. It doesn't seem like that's a business, more like a hobby. But... Hey, is Lauren going to be busy today? She's coming in. She's picking up my outfit. Oh. This is her. It's, it's uh, oh. more and more bookstores oh. in the... Uh, it's the crazy guy with all the books. Oh my God. <laughs> the uh, um, more and more used bookstores are going out of business because you can just put your books on the internet. And if you have forty thousand books, I've, I've, I mean, I know people. I have friends who used to own bookstores, and that's what they do now. And they, they say, you know, I can just spend, pay somebody like five thousand dollars to put my books on the internet. And I'll just sell them over the internet. I don't have somebody coming in and stealing things. I don't have somebody coming in and leaving things out or taking pages out. I don't have to worry about any of that. I don't have to pay $2,700. And it's uh, one of the things that we do now. Now we, we start, uh, we have certain books that we only sell on the internet. And uh, we sell them. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you can, I, I know that if I put all my books on the internet, I could make more money than what I do now. What prevents you from doing it? Because I just don't want to look at a computer screen all day. I want the bookstore. I wanted to be the bookstore guy. And I think that, 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 uh, I think it's essential that people have bookstores. I think that it's essential that you can go into some place and regardless of whether you have money or not, you can look and, and get information. It might not be the exact information you're looking for, but you can find other things. It's called browsing. People think browsing is just the internet now, but browsing to, uh, <clears throat> older people is looking for books, stumbling upon something you can't believe. We, we don't have a place for, uh, for first editions. We just put all the first editions in there. So if somebody's looking for you know, some Ernest Hemingway and they're a big Ernest Hemingway fan, they could find a first edition. While it might be $40, I mean, it's certainly competitive, but they can find it. Or if somebody just wants to buy first editions just because they can brag to their friends they have first editions, you know, that's, you can order that off the internet. It should be something that you... That's just my uh, opinion. Uh, obviously, it's very archaic because there's less and less bookstores. You don't see too many these bookstores opening up anymore. It's kind of sad. Someday we will be very old and we'll be telling somebody, oh, we went in the stores, they had thousands of books. Little kids now come in. We, for Halloween, we gave away we give away free books for Halloween. Instead of candy, we give away books. And we gave, uh, gave away 42, 40 boxes of books. We saved them all year. I mean, it was... We have pictures of it. It was, it was, it was such a great thing. Yeah, here. Oh, do you have any? Pictures of what? Oh, the. Yeah. The wrong way. We got pictures of us being robbed. <laughs> We're robbed a lot. What are people robbing you for? Um, are you talking about getting yeah. stuck up or in the middle of the night or what? Well, people smash out the window or they come in and they grab the register and try to run out or whatever the whole little thing is. But we, but for Halloween, we and we just tried this. We were we wanted to give away uh, books and see how that went. So I envisioned in my mind that. We would have some books, and these kids would get really mad and like throw the books all over because they wanted candy, and and it's not what happened. We had uh, we were keeping track of how many children came in. We lost track around 952 children came in here. We, we gave away 40 boxes of books, like 20 at least 2,300 books, and how many kids did we have? it was it was 952. Yeah, we lost and we lost count. Kids that we could count. Yeah, that we could count. And they and, were all thrilled. They were all yeah. Screaming, smiling, running, telling their moms. They were hoarding the books. <laughs> they were running up saying thank you. Usually a kid's going, thank you. And their mother says, tell them thank you. These kids were running up. They, were, they would drop their bags of candy and say, we can, we can just have the, yeah, you can have a couple books. So, I mean, and, I mean it, was, it, was, uh, it was tremendous. I just never, uh, I just, it was just, uh, it was, uh, I, I envisioned it as something that was going to be a real pain in the ass. 
But it wasn't. It was something that... I mean, it was really wonderful to uh, watch and to uh, see these kids just being so excited. And you think about it, like, if a third of those kids... If a third of those kids looked at those books, one out of three, that means there's 300 kids that were reading a book that yesterday they didn't. And, you know, and those kids would come in and they, they, they would say things like, is this a library? It's like, no, you come in, you buy books. So I can just buy the book? I mean, they had, they had no idea what a bookstore was. What is, uh, what's the state of book reading and literacy in our culture and our society at this point in history? I don't know. I mean... The book is, uh, book is, books are on their way out. People aren't going to have books anymore. Books are too big. Eventually you'll, and they have, now they call, what do they call those, pocket pals, where you have a little, it's uh, something about the, pal, the size of the palm of your hand, and it, you can keep all your phone numbers, all palm information, pilot. palm pilot. But eventually you'll be able to, like, have the same idea, plug it into a phone line and get three newspapers, a couple chapters out of a couple books you want to see, and... And so, instead of carrying, lugging all these books around, people will just look at that, and it'll be much, uh, it'll be much easier. And while we can sit there and we can go on and on about how, oh, there's something the tactile pleasure of books and blah 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 blah, people said the same crap about the radio. People said the same stuff about when they, instead of handmade books, they had printed books. Nobody will read the the, ha the printed books. Nobody. They said the same thing when radio and TV. You know, there'll still be radio. There's no people don't listen to radio. People watch TV. It'll be the same thing. and uh, So this is a giant antique mall, except o only if it was 100 years in the future. But, but there'll be still some people that will want to hold a book to... Uh, eventually, it won't, it, we won't have books. It'll be something that look like hieroglyphics. It's, it's too difficult of a thing to have when you can have many more, much more information in a smaller object. It just doesn't make sense to... And hopefully there'll be some other bald-headed guy here <laughs> selling books, but they'll probably be antiques instead of current. Who, if you would decide to sell this place, who are you going to sell it to? Do you have some sort of criteria of the person you would want to see succeed you? Yeah, I would certainly hope to have somebody that would uh, continue it as a bookstore. I, mean, I could uh, obviously just uh, close the place and just sell the stock as it is for for enough money but I just like to have it continue I think it's important I think bookstores are important things ha happen here people have play they have a chess night here they have experimental music here the Dungeons and Dragons people play the little role playing games I mean these are like a bunch of goofy teenage guys who've been here for years and if they can you know come here and smoke cigarettes and play their little game they're not on the street hassling people they're not they're, you know that's some place to go people come in here and there's people who come in here for hours and they don't have a dime. They'll sit and they'll read a book. And what do I care? So I'm, I don't care. People, we have a, a, a wall that people put up notices. And it's everything from some guy that wants to lick someone's toe to uh, uh, stopping the Ku Klux Klan from having a march to uh, plays to everything. It's, it's where a lot of people get a lot of information from. And uh, people are you know, coming here and will either talk politics or computer and they can do whatever they want and it's and there's not a uh, unless someone's really loud you you can't sit there and say we're not going to talk about that when we have so many different subjects that somebody can I mean it's kind of nice it's kind of a it's not like you're going to find that when you're buying used pairs of jeans I think it's kind of nice I, I hope that uh, somebody will continue the thing I've done it for 10 years it's a great thing it's a wonderful wonderful uh, occupation. Who are some contemporary artists, uh, contemporary writers, authors who you, right now, want to tell people 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now they should be taking a look at, whether it's on their Palm Pilot or looking... Uh, There's a man named Stuart Dybeck, D-Y-B-E-K, and he's a Chicago writer. He's actually pretty famous, and uh, but he, he uh, grew up on the south side by sort of where I grew up, and uh, and I think that it's that his books and, and his short stories are uh, very reflective of what uh, it's like to live in a city in uh, the late 20th century. I think he's a wonderful person to uh, read. Sometimes we even have crazy people outside yelling. But uh, that's just how it goes. Who else? 
Um, there's a. Uh, wow, who else can we think of? I think there's a. Uh, hey. The what? Oh no no, I'll do that. I'm just kind of busy right now. I'm gonna do it in a second. I got the shovel and everything. Oh. Uh, I yeah, I know. I, just I'll, trying to make a legit buck. I know. I appreciate it. I like to put a book in your store too. Dude, you're gonna put salt down for five dollars? All the way, all the way to the, the whole sidewalk. Yeah, yours. Go ahead. I yeah. want to put a book in here too, though. All right. I'll talk. To you. All right. Perhaps he's going to be somebody that's going to. I, there's, a, there's a, I think a, there's a. There's a man named Ron Carlson who I think is an excellent writer. I think he's uh, looked over. And there's a, a person named uh, uh, George Dennison. I know they're all guy writers. George Dennison, he's dead, but he's a, a great writer. What about some women? <sighs> some women. Uh, Sandra Cisneros, she's actually from here. Um, she's a, a poet. She also wrote some, some fiction. And um, I'm trying to think. Other stuff I've read. Anyway, do you have anything? Current uh, authors that you think people should still be reading 50 years from now? Oh, wow. Um, so hard to say. But... I mean, I would certainly hope that, pe that people would be reading things like Fax Douglas's book. He's, yeah. a, he's a poet that actually has really influenced a lot of people and uh, does some really important things in uh, the city when it comes to uh, performance and for poetry, I mean, he's, he's, he runs the poetry night here, and he actually makes his living off of being a poet. Um, it's not too many people on the planet that can do that, and he does. And uh, he puts together shows that are almost variety shows that he has at different places, and they're um, amazing things to watch. Everything from a couple of guys from California playing guitar to somebody standing up and saying some crazy poem to somebody doing a juggling act. And it's continue, he's been able to do this for years, and, so, and, he's, and he's an excellent poet. So, Would you just work out with this guy? Oh, he uh, came in, he wanted to shovel the sidewalk because it's snowing outside, and uh, for five dollars, which is actually the, sort of the going rate, but um, a lot of times they'll only shovel it just, just a little pathway, and, but if he says he's going to put salt down for five dollars, that's fine. That's a, you know, he wants to do it, that's fine. Make himself five dollars. Anything else come to mind that you want to talk about? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Will you tell me your name again and where we are? My name's uh, Joseph Brian Judd, and we are at fourteen sixty eight Milwaukee. It's Myopic Bookstore, and it's uh, the seventh of December, the day after my sister's birthday. <laughs> A day that will live in infamy now, December seventh. <laughs> Judd is your nickname or your last name? That's my uh, last name, Jack D. Thanks, man. All right.